morning, everyone. Uh, looks like nearly everyone has come back from coffee. Um, as Keith said, my name is Shane Grennan. Um, I work for Fortinet in Ireland. Um, and my session is going to talk about the 2013 threat landscape and some of the implications for cloud and virtualization. So by way of introduction, in case uh, there's anyone out there that doesn't know um, about Fortinet, we're the fourth largest global security vendor, um, according to the figures from IDC. Um, we're the leader in the UTM market segment, so UTM being unified threat management. So we lead the Gartner Magic Quadrant, and Frost and & Sullivan also have us as the leader in the UTM market segment. So we're a big publicly traded security company. Um, generally, when people try to engage in, in cloud conversations or it comes up in conversation, whether it be socially or in meetings or whatever the format, um, I generally have a fairly emotional response to the, the cloud conversation. Uh, and the reason for that is that, I guess as you probably all know, the term cloud is misused, overused, misunderstood, so it's thrown around quite a lot. So I generally have a, a, a large level of skepticism at the start of a conversation because you never know if it's going to be a good conversation or is it going to be a bad conversation. So I generally go through five stages, I suppose, of emotional response depending on is it a good conversation or a bad one. Stage one is generally this. So I give them my Tommy, Tommy Lee Jones face and try and discourage them from actually having a conversation around cloud or just to try and figure out do you really want to have this conversation and, and is it going to be good or is it going to be bad. So then we go on to stage two. And it's, so brace yourself, the cloud conversation is coming. And, and unlike Ned Stark, if you, if you know who that is, we're try, try not to lose our heads. So uh, he's focused on winter coming, we're focused on cloud coming. And like him, I guess, we're not sure on the horizon, is it a long way off or is it uh, closer than we think. Then stage three, it's like, oh wow, really? You're, think about, you're thinking about doing it. And I get quite surprised, I suppose, depending on the conversation, in terms of the level of adoption, the pace of adoption, et cetera. So then the question is, OK, you're, do, you're planning on doing this. Wow, when are you going to do it? And then it's, oh, wow, you're doing it right now. OK. So depending on, the, as I said, the, the tone of the conversation, is it good or is it bad, we get to stage five. And stage five generally looks like this. So hopefully none of the people sitting in the audience and haven't seen the presentations earlier on feel like this already. But I know obviously the term cloud is going to be said quite a lot today. OK, so in a little bit more serious manner. So this, this graphic is one of the best ones I could find in terms of, I suppose, highlighting the different layers and the devolving responsibility as you adopt uh, and move from dedicated I3, IT, through hosting, colo, et cetera, and over to infrastructure platform or software as a service. Indeed, whether it be cloud based or public or private cloud based. So the bits in green are the bits you have control over, exclusive control. So you can see on the left where it's dedicated IT, IT, you have full operational control over every layer of the stack except typically the network layer, assuming you have a wide area network. So the yellow bits, rec uh, and I know from standing at the back you can't read any of this text, so I'll call some of it out. Uh, the yellow bits is where the organization shares control with the service provider. So here it's yellow. And naturally enough, enough as you move uh, further over towards the right, and the red bits are where your service provider has total control and you have no control. So logically enough, I guess, as you move from left to right, more of the layers move into operational control of the service provider. And I guess that's the whole point, right? That's why you, you may be doing the cloud adoption. And an upside in your mind might be, well, that's great because I now have no longer operational responsibility for all those layers. Therefore, I don't have security responsibility for all those layers. And yes, you won't have operational responsibility for all of those uh, layers, but you still have a responsibility, a corporate responsibility, obviously, to secure your data. So you need to engage with the cloud provider and have conversations around what does the security look like at the different layers, even if the layers are red and you have no uh, direct operational control over them. Um, so if you look at the security services that are out there today, um, they're chopped up in general into things that protect and control users over on the bottom right-hand corner, things that protect and control <coughs> services uh, and data up in the top left-hand corner. So over for users, you have things like application control, DLP, web filtering, anti-spam, et cetera, moving further up through IPS firewall, and then all the way up to things that are uh, firmly in the data and service protection space, so DDoS, protection, WAF or web application firewall protection, um, IDS, et cetera. But some of the bits in the middle, 
specifically firewall, antivirus or anti-malware, and intrusion prevention have, a, have a, a place to play in both sides of the camp. Now, I guess I'd get no argument from people in terms of, yes, obviously, a firewall is needed uh, on, even in the cloud and in the user protection side, the same with antivirus. But for example, IPS or intrusion prevention has a very important part to play in user protection. So all of your users browse the, the uh, internet using a browser. They look at material using Flash Player, et cetera. All of those applications have vulnerabilities. And if you want to protect the asset that the user is using while browsing the web, you need to have IPS looking at those vulnerabilities. So IPS isn't all about just data or service protection. It has a role to play in, uh, in user protection as well. So even if you make the assumption that we've gone to cloud, all of those layers, data and service protection layers, I don't have to worry about it. That's the responsibility of the cloud provider. It still leaves you with a lot of security solutions that you have to provide for your users. And it, it varies widely in terms of my, I suppose, engagement with um, you know, press, analysts, end users in terms of what they think about uh, of security in a full cloud adoption. And some of them have the utopian idea of, well, when we go to cloud, we're just going to have a building full of people. Everyone will have an iPad and will be connected to the internet, and therefore we require uh, no security whatsoever. But of course, they forget that all of this stuff is there today to protect users, and you're still going to have to protect your users. So. so today, um, I suppose the threat landscape is being driven predominantly or exclusively by advanced persistent threats. Um, and in the press, there's lots of other terms that get thrown around. You see cyber war, cyber crime, hacktivism, cyber terrorism, generalized threats. So generalized threats differ from advanced persistent threats. So a generalized threat might be something like a piece of malware that um, one of your users picks up or indeed you pick up on your uh, PC or laptop. An advanced persistent threat might be a multi-layer DDoS attack um, against your organization. So it's driven by a, a piece of human intervention. They have a, a specific task and target in mind. And if attack number one fails, they'll try attack number two, three, four, five, and they'll use different techniques to try and gain their objective. Um, that's an advanced per persistent threat, or APT. Um, and as I said, a generalized threat might be a general malware infection. So in fact, a generalized threat, if you think of it, are, are like the bullets in the gun, and the APT is the actual gun. So you'll have lots and lots of different generalized threats, but some physical person will end up pointing the gun and firing the generalized threats to encapsulate it into an APT. And those terms, cyber war, cyber crime, et cetera, they're, they're kind of meaningless, right? Because what you're focused on is what somebody is going to do to you or your organization. So if both parties happen to be governments, then you'll probably use the term cyber war. If one party is a government and one is an ideology, then one side will use the term cyber terrorism and the other side will use the term cyber war. Uh, so it depends on from which side you're looking at it, which term you're going to use. But really, as I said, the, the terms are actually meaningless. What you're worried about is what someone is going to do to um, attack you. So in my opinion, for sure, the biggest trend not just recently, but throughout IT security. So the age of IT security has been complexity. So when, uh, when threats, I suppose, started to become very serious and insidious, there, there was something holding them back. The complexity of the vulnerability that was used to launch the attack was very complex. But the nature of actually using that to launch an attack was very complex as well. So you had a very small number of people that could deal with the complexity of the vulnerability and the complexity of the usage of the vulnerability. So therefore, security in general and, and the level of incidence was low because it was, as I said, few people with that level of, uh, of knowledge. But over time, unfortunately, the level or the complexity level of the attacks has continued to rise, as you would expect. But the level of complexity of the usage of those attacks has gone down through the floor. So today, there's many, many attacks out there that you can, uh, you can read about um, and that you do read about. And the complexity of them is very high. But unfortunately, the, the uh, application developers in the <coughs> cybersecurity space have overlain that complexity with a nice set of GUIs. So you can download a tool. Uh, it has a nice front end. You can enter an IP address and hit a big red button that says attack, and that's all you have to do. So without any shadow of doubt in my mind, using Google, I'm for sure anybody in this room would be able to launch an attack of one type or another on a, a, another uh, customer uh, or company that they didn't like because, as I said, the complexity has dropped through the floor. And that's a huge concern. So we see crime, CAS or crime as a service. So cybercrime 
um, again, as I said, irrespective of which party is implementing it, we'll call it cyber crime, um, is what is driving um, the security space at the moment. Um, and as we see, like all business models, um, crime as a service has a business model as well. So they have business goals, and like the business goals of every company, essentially it's profitability. So every company typically has shareholders, whether they be internal stakeholders or external uh, uh, stockholders, and the aim is to drive the profitability of the company, and the aim of a cyber crime organization is to drive the profitability of that organization as well. They have a partner program, like all good businesses. We have lots of partners that uh, you buy Fortinet technology from, and the cybercrime uh, industry has a partner program as well. Now, of course, uh, again, I realize you can't read that graphic, but that slide is advertising um, for partner recruitment. So it's listing the price per 1,000 infections that someone can earn. So if you wanted to earn a little bit of money, you can go to this website. If you ha were capable of delivering the infection onto 1,000 hosts, at the top of the stack is the United States, you'd earn $140. So if you can infect 1,000 machines, you'll earn yourself $140. Not particularly a huge amount of money, I guess, but depending from where in the world the infection has been driven, $140 might be quite a lot of money. And as you go down the stack, um, you get the value drops. So obviously an asset that's infected in the United States is more than um, the countries that are lower on, typically in, uh, in Asia. And you can look for technical support. So this graphic here is showing is advertising um, for $250. You can buy an advanced build of the Zeus botnet, and you get 24 by 7 technical support for $250. It's not bad. Um, they do advertising. So here you can see a website that's advertising a cloud cracking um, password. So it uses cloud computing for someone that has a password that they've stolen from someone. They can enter it into the cloud tool, and it uses mass computational resources to try and crack the encrypted password. Um, and they see, we see them doing industry partnership as well. So most recently, the cybercrime gang that was developing the Zeus botnet and the SpyEye botnet have come together for joint software development. So over time, we see the cybercrime groups behaving more like a business because essentially, as I said, they're being driven by profitability. Um, so here are some more of the services available um, in crime as a service. I'll go down through a couple of them. I should point out um, these are all taken from the 2013 cybercrime report that Fortinet brings out. We bring it out once a year, and about a month ago we brought out the 2013 version. So we have printed copies of that on our stand. So if you'd like to read it in full, just drop by the stand and, and take a copy. So you see things like consulting services. So consulting could be on software development, deployment, how do I evade detection, how do I keep my software stable. Basically, it could be on anything. And you, we see prices, an average price of $375 per consulting engagement. Um, infection spreading, so as I said, average $100 per 1,000 infections. Um, you can rent a botnet for $10 per hour. Yeah, I heard someone say, but I won't repeat. The first time I saw that figure, I was, uh, I was amazed as well. So if you do the maths in terms of if you want to attack an organization and you can rent a botnet with 100,000 hosts in it for $10 an hour, how cheap it is to implement a DDoS attack. And then you compare that against the cost of mitigation that that customer will have to pay to mitigate the DDoS attack, which is more in the region of 20 to 30 to $40,000. DDoS is a really inexpensive way of punishing an organization that you might choose to dislike in some way. Um, you can buy services for quality assurance and detection, um, onshore and offshore hosting. So you know, the software has to sit somewhere that they're serving out. So typically, onshore in the Western, uh, Western world, that's uh, done without the knowledge of the, of the hosting provider. So either a company has taken hosting or they've compromised someone else's hosting and now they're serving software um, uh, off, the, off the hosting provider without their knowledge. Typically offshore, so um, going um, further east in the world, it's done with the complicity of the hosting provider. So they're not, I suppose, as, as compliance driven and they don't have as many issues around hosting uh, nefarious customers. Um, you can do upgrades, black hat search optimization, so you can bypass the typical search filters um, that a search engine would use to get your website to the top. And then other technical services such as password cracking, fast flux networking, and, and capture breaking. So fast flux networking is a really good way of, of hiding a person's activity online um, if they don't want uh, anyone to find out what they're doing. So botnets, I mean, are, are, they're the backbone of, of all cybercrime activity, and that's what you're, I suppose, that's what you're fighting against, whether it be the generalized threat in which case you don't want some of your assets to be become infected and become part of a botnet, or you don't want to be on the receiving end of what the botnet is dishing out. And what they dish out typically is things like um, DDoS, stealing data, and money laundering. 
So um, DDoS will talk a little bit more about, obviously, stealing data from the infected PCs. So a lot of the malware that will go down onto an end uh, system is designed to be evasive, but also to try and capture um, user data. And obviously, one of the most favorite ones would be the, the user's online banking credentials. Uh, and money laundering. So there's two really good ways of, of money laundering using botnets. One is click fraud, and the other is Skype. Um, so I'll do, talk through uh, click fraud. So if I have a website, I can sign up to an advertising network, and every user that comes from my website and clicks through, I get paid for. So then I become a money mule. So one of the cybercrime people comes to me and says, OK, we're going to use your advertising network to generate and, and launder a whole lot of money. So they use the botnet to drive a huge volume of click throughs through my website. I earn a huge amount of money from the advertising network, and then I pass on a percentage to the cybercrime organization. So they've used their dirty money to fuel my business, and I give them back. Uh, cleaned legal, uh, legal money. So they send spam. They can uh, be a, a facilitator for fast flux networking, as I said, and proxies. So proxies, for example, in countries where um, bit torrenting uh, music and films is actually illegal and people get prosecuted, they would use proxies to, tr to hide their identity. Fast flux networking would be more uh, in, the, in the, the, the hardcore of the criminal element, I suppose, where they're exchanging material or doing activities that are you know, very, very illegal and they, they want to hide their activities. Uh, you can, they can be used for compute resource, so infected machines. So if, you, if your PC is infected, it may be con contributing com computational resource um, for password cracking as part of a cloud service. It'll try to spread itself, and it can be used for, for storage as well. Um, and 60% of botnet infections are drive-by, so that means a user goes to a website and they get infected. That's all they have to do. Either that website has malware embedded in it, or there's redirects in the background to direct, direct you off without the, the user knowing to a website that serves up the malware. So there's nothing, they don't have to do anything, uh, you know, uh, anything more complex than visiting a website. So the four things in brief that I want to run through that we should be, I suppose, protecting against are DDoS, uh, data theft, destruction, and loss of reputation. So up until 2011 and, and the start of 2012, um, this was the, the brief evolution of DDoS. So it started off with a small number of machines with limited power, and they spoofed the source IP address so that it, it wasn't very easy to stop the DDoS attack. Uh, then we moved up to non-spoof clients, so they got the, the botnet spread in size, so there was enough source, source IP addresses, so they didn't have to engage in spoofing. But again, the power, power had gone up, but it was somewhat limited. And then they started infecting servers, so uh, hardware with a lot more computational power, a lot more greater access to bandwidth, and then um, the, the size of the DDoS attacks started to uh, increase exponentially. <coughs> so right now, today, the, pr the real problem with DDoS is that it's cheap to launch. Um, it's very simple to launch. The size is actually decreasing. The size of the average DDoS attack is going down, which is something to worry about as opposed to something to be pleased about. Um, and the complexity is increasing. So they're cheap to launch. And again, as we said, for 500, and in this example, $530 for five hours a day for, for one week. So for about $1,000, I could attack any company I want 24 hours a day for five days a week. And you'll get a, a, a botnet for, with about 100,000 hosts in it. So you're going to launch a reasonably sized DDoS attack. And as I said, it'll cost that company, if they, they engage um, a hosting provider to provide a DDoS scrubbing service, it'll pro probably cost them in the region of thirty dollars to $35,000 to mitigate that attack. So it's cost me $1,000, but it's cost them thirty-five dollars to mitigate the attack. And that's the whole point. It's not just to take down the service of the customer, but it's to financially penalize the, the customer by launching a DDoS attack. They're simple to launch. So here's a couple of screenshots of some of the tools. So low orbit ion cannon, and there's, there's two different versions there, that can be used to launch a DOS attack, so a single point attack from, from a big, big host, or more often high orbit ion cannon. So if I decide I want to launch a DDoS attack against uh, one of you people, um, I, go on, I rent the botnet, they point me at the the, the nice GUI, and as you can see, you basically put in the IP address and you hit the big red, red button which says fire the laser, um, and the DDoS attack is launched. And that's, it's as simple as that. Now, the other problem is you would think, if you look at the, the press, that all of the DDoS attacks that are out there are 50, 60 gig, and you know, recently we had the largest ever seen DDoS attack on the internet. Um, and I understand the difficulty here because the press are trying to report a, a very, very technical scenario to a non-technical audience or via a non-technical medium. So naturally enough, they latch on to something that's very identifiable, which is the big number. But in fact, the size of DDoS attacks is going down. And this graph from ZDNet, which we would, we would agree with, so it says that 76% of DDoS attacks last year were less than one gig. 
And that's a, a definite trend that we're seeing out there as well. Over time, the size of the average DDoS attack is going down. And the reason that they're going down is that the complexity of the attacks is, is going up. So this is a screenshot from uh, an actual one of our DDoS protection appliances that's deployed on a customer site. So basically, you have the layer at which the protection was applied and the number of packets. So if you can see, and I'm pretty sure you can't, you see layer seven. At layer seven, 304 packets were dropped. So using layer seven inspection, they dropped 304 packets. But if you look at layer three and layer four, the sum of those is 6.6 .6 billion. So it dropped 6.6 packet, .6 billion packets using layer three and layer four inspection. And a lot of DDoS uh, solutions that are out there stop at layer three and layer four. But the problem is that the attack at the web server was only 304 packets, but it was hidden inside 6.6 .6 billion packets. So how are you gonna find 304 packets in 6.6 .6 billion if you're just using um, volumetric protection, which is, is based on statistical sampling? Well, the, the answer is you're not. Um, so the key trend in historically, DDoS protection or mitigation had a slow response because it required human intervention. So you had to realize you're under attack or someone monitoring your service had to realize you're under attack. And then there was human intervention involved. I, you had to mess with BGP or DNS to send your traffic off to a scrubbing center. We've moved towards next generation DDoS protection where it's hardware assisted to be able to find that layer seven attack hidden in all those billions and billions of packets. And it's automatic mitigation. So you have something with intelligence that knows what your good traffic profile looks like. And if something strays out of that, and if the service is under threat, it takes automatic action. If you're under attack and the service hasn't been affected, do you really care? Well, not so much because your service is still up. Okay, I have a short video. And this is talking about disruption. At, at in June the last year, a computer virus called Stuxnet was discovered lurking in the data banks of power plants, traffic control systems, and factories around the world. 20 times more complex than any previous virus code, it had an array of capabilities. Among them, the ability to turn up the pressure inside nuclear reactors or switch off oil pipelines, and Stuxnet could tell the system operators everything was normal. Unlike most viruses, Stuxnet doesn't carry the usual forged security clearance that helps viruses burrow into systems. It actually had a real clearance, stolen from one of the most reputable computer technology companies in the world. It exploited security gaps that system creators are unaware of. These holes are known as zero days, and the most successful viruses exploit them. The details of a zero day can be sold on the black market for $100,000. Stuxnet took advantage of 20 zero days. But once it got into a system, it didn't always activate. Buried deep in the Stuxnet code was a specific target. Without that target, the virus remained dormant. What was it looking to shut down? The centrifuges that spin nuclear material at Iran's enrichment facilities. Stuxnet was a weapon the first to be made entirely out of code. The Washington-based Institute for Science and International Security says the virus may have shut down a thousand centrifuges at Natanz, Iran's main enrichment facility, last year. In November, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the UN's nuclear watchdog, said Iran had suspended work at its nuclear facilities without explaining why. Many observers credited Stuxnet. Last month, the Iranian government conceded the virus's infection of the Bashir nuclear facility, still under construction, meant that switching the plant on could lead to a national electricity blackout. Iran has responded to the attack with an open call for hackers to join the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and has reportedly amassed the second largest online army in the world. So who was behind Stuxnet? There's no evidence beyond rumor. Some have it that Israel is responsible because the virus virus code apparently contains references to the Hebrew Bible. Others believe the US was involved in the testing and development. The finger has even been pointed at Siemens mobile phone company, whose software is used by the Iranian regime. The most important question may not be who designed it, but who will redesign it. The evolution has been so fast that nine months after its detection, 
the first virus that could crash power grids or destroy oil pipelines is available online for anyone to download and tinker with. You can watch people on YouTube pulling Stuxnet apart. It's an open source weapon. And there's no way of knowing who will use it or what they will use it for. So that, that's a very good video that, uh, as you guessed, I suppose, walks you through Stuxnet. So Stuxnet was the first piece of malware, malware discovered um, that targeted physical destruction. Now, that video is a little bit old, so we subsequently know through, uh, I suppose, general admission that actually Stuxnet was developed by um, Israel and the, the US together, allegedly, um, to target the Iranian uh, nuclear development facilities. And since then, we've seen iterations and evolutions of Stuxnet with two, two, uh, two more variants. Um, so if you're in um, the business uh, that has anything to do with SCADA protection, um, Stuxnet is, is, is targeted to attack those PLC and SCADA systems. I realize I'm out of time, so I'll keep, I will move. Uh, second slide on destruction. Um, so specifically tar targeted at end user systems. And again, you, you probably can't see that, but this is doing the rounds in Ireland at the moment, so it's called ransomware. So basically, the user will get this put up on the screen. You can see the Garda Shiakana logo. So basically, it's designed to present to the user, and it says, you've been accessing nefarious websites, um, and in line with legislation, you now have to pay a fine. And they put this up on the screen. So it says you've been infected. Either it says you've been infected by a piece of malware, or they take the legal route where it says you've been doing something illegal. Um, you need to go using PayPal or buy a voucher and input that into this system so that you can, um, we, we leave you alone and you can continue your business. So that's doing, as I said, the rounds in Ireland recently. It's the first one I've seen that's been targeted specifically um, at Ireland. I've seen them in, in other countries quite a lot. Um, but generally, you know, that one can be easily mitigated if the end user knows what they're doing. Um, more troubling ones are um, full disk encryption. So you piece up, pick up a piece of malware that encrypts your full disk. So it does it nice and slowly until the last minute where it pops this up in front of your screen and it says, hey, we just encrypted your full disk. It gives you details how to give them the money and then fields where you enter the encryption key. So you know, obviously, if any of you use full disk encryption to protect your user assets, without the encryption key, you cannot get the data back. So what are you going to do? Well, you're, you're going to have to pay them. Um, data theft, I won't dwell on this slide, but basically most data theft occurs when a website is compromised. So, you know, I don't know how many people are, involved, are, are affected by the LinkedIn breach last year. So my credentials were one of the credentials stolen. So, you're, you know, when, if your credentials are stolen from a website that you use, they may be encrypted. Indeed, they should be encrypted. The trouble is, using crowdsourcing, an encrypted password isn't a, a, a huge level of protection in terms of your details not being made available. So here we have a crowdsourcing database with uh, 30 billion entries. So it has 30 billion MD5 hashes in there. So you can take a stolen password, on the top enter the MD5 hash, which is a bunch of encrypted junk. It runs it through the database and it finds a match, it tells you what the password is. So people are constantly feeding voluntarily information into this database so that you can match an MD5 or SHA-1 hash against um, the text. Uh, okay. And lastly, some predictions. So these, again, we produce a report yearly on what the predictions are going to be like for the next year. So we think that APTs will target individuals and using their mobiles. So advanced per persistent threats typically target an organization. We think they're going to focus down onto perceived high-value individuals, such as executives, celebrities, and politicians, and do it via their mobile. Um, Password-only authentication is going to end. I mean, how many more breaches do we have to see of websites um, that use single-factor authentication before it dies? So we think this year will be the end of it. Machine-to-machine um, -machine will be targeted. So whether that be uh, you know, your fridge at home logging online uh, to order milk because it can tell that the milk is out of the fridge, or something like a healthcare system where two machines are talking to each other to affect patient care. So if communication like that becomes compromised, you have some very serious results. But we're starting to see those being targeted. Um, exploits will move beyond the sandbox. So if you're virtualized, you, we, we will see malware that will move across the boundary from one VM to the other. Um, Cross-platform botnets, so a mix of a botnet that's made up of mobile devices, i.e. Uh, PDAs and PCs and fixed assets, and the growth of mobile malware. So right now we monitor about 50,000 pieces of malware, mobile malware out there, whereas we, we monitor millions and millions and millions of traditional malware. But that ratio is going to change uh, this year. Okay, thank you very much for your time.